Hello, this is Glenn Fleischman. I'm an editor at Tidbits, the Mac publication that covers all things Apple and iOS, and I'm also the author of Take Control of Your 802.11 Airport Network, an ebook that talks about how to set up Wi Fi networks with Apple's equipment and Apple hardware, uh, iOS and Mac, and also describes all the Windows options for connecting to airport gear. And today I'm going to walk you through the new version of Airport Utility 6.0 that works with Mac OS 10 10.7 Lion. Now this new version, which I'll show you here, is a big split, a big change from previous versions of the software, and it's made some people unhappy because so many features appear to have been taken away. Many of those features are in fact just hidden, not removed, and I'll walk you through some of those. Some features for network administrators are missing, but you can still use Airport Utility 5.5.3 for Snow Leopard and for Leopard, and use a new Airport Utility 5.6 that's been updated for Lion. Both of those older versions are still available for download. You can install them even with Airport 6.0 installed. They'll install under their old number and use those con uh, continuously with even the newest Airport Base Station firmware updates that Apple released recently. So you don't have to give up those features, you just can't use Airport Utility 6.0. The main reason to use Airport Utility 6.0 if you have no other needs is to register iCloud accounts, that is Apple IDs migrated from MobileMe or registered with iCloud to start with, for back to my Mac access to drives inside a time capsule or connected to an Airport Extreme Base Station or time capsule from elsewhere on the internet. An iCloud ID lets you use back to my Mac for free MobileMe has supported Back to My Mac for remote access for years, but until recently you had to pay for a MobileMe account. This is the first time you can easily use Back to My Mac for free. I use it all the time for remotely configuring base stations and accessing files on drives attached or inside base stations. So let's do a quick walkthrough here. So what you see is uh, this big internet globe, of course, and if you click it, as you can click any of these icons showing the layout of a network, you see information. It shows me that I'm connected to the internet, there's a green light there, it shows me the routers that I'm using to connect, which are Comcast routers in this case, and it has information about my internet connection. Now you see the router address here looks artificial because I'm connecting through Comcast's uh, private networking setup. Uh, the rest of my network is laid out hierarchically. So this Airport Bay, Airportage Bay base station is a base station that I have connected directly, as you can see in the line, to the internet, which is the broadband modem, and then connected to my airport base station, the Airportage Bay model here, are two additional ones connected via Ethernet, which is represented by this solid line. I have a downstairs Airport Extreme Base Station older model that uses a single band at a time, and an Airport Express in our guest room. And this a hierarchical display lets you know exactly which components are arrayed in what way. This base station in the middle, Airportage Bay, is feeding out information to the other two to which it's connected physically, and the green dots show me that everything is active. Now you see when I click on the Airportage Bay base station, or in fact, of course, any of these base stations here, I can click and get additional information. So in this case, I'll click on Airportage Bay and it shows me the network, its IP address on the network, the uh, local addresses being fed out, the LAN IP address to devices in the network, serial number, version number of the firmware. Uh, two, uh, these status messages are funny, these are two errors. These are things that I've agreed to allow to happen even though Air, uh, Apple considers them errors. So I'm set up over WAN as a security issue which you can bypass, which means you can let your base station be set up over uh, uh, outside the local network over the internet and double NAT means that I've got private addresses being fed by Comcast to my network from the internet and that I'm feeding out private addresses to my own network. This isn't an ideal configuration but for my purposes it's the best arrangement to work partly because Comcast wants fifteen dollars a month for a single private IP address and a public IP address and I'd rather not pay that money for that. Now there's other things you can find out too. Apple's moved to a hovering over model so we start at this first level where I've clicked on something I get basic information. Now if I hover over the base station name you see ah there's some additional information you get here. I can see and see I move away it goes off. It tells me the model number, it tells me three MAC addresses. The MAC addresses or media access control addresses are the unique number for an adapter. These are assigned at a factory and uh, are used to identify something uniquely each adapter. So the Ethernet adapter has one on the WAN side. The Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz radio has one and the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi radio has another. If I hover away from that 
You see I can hover over other things. There's no information there, no information there. It's kind of an exploratory thing. If I hover over this, I can see there's a pop-down menu and get this information. I can change the setting, click Edit, and choose whether or not. We're doing a little advanced here, but it shows me the dialog. I'll bring come back to that in a minute. But if I hover over wireless clients, you'll see I can get additional information about each of the clients or the devices connected to my network. Here's my iPad. It's connected using, you can see at the bottom, PHY or physical mode. That's the adapter or the encoding used for the actual physical connection. In this case, physical means wireless. Uh, 802.11a slash n means it's using the 5 gigahertz band, tells me the data rate, 65 megabits per second, and the RSSI is a measure of how much noise to signal there is, and that's a good measurement there. It's sort of hard to sort out. I realize the quality rating is probably more important. It says excellent. And I can hover over each of these and see information about that. Now there's one hidden feature here, uh, something that I had to uh, discover with help from someone else, which is that if you want to reverse your firmware update. This has been possible in older versions of Airport Utility and seem to be not available in this release. But if you hold down the Option key, aha, suddenly this becomes available. You can see previous available firmware releases for your model of base station that you're looking at. Select it and then uh, revert to that previous firmware release. Sometimes if you have a bug, if Apple releases something or there's a problem on your network, you may want to back up to a previous firmware release until a new release comes out that solves the problem. So you can see this is true for all these. There's different information for each of these, um, but again, I can hover over the name. It provides me information. You can see here I've got a few different devices connected. You can see information about them. All this is the same. So uh, you can also see up in the upper left corner, it's going to be hard to see on the screencast, other airport base stations. This shows me if there's any base stations that are unconfigured but available within wireless range of the computer I'm using right now, uh, which I can configure very easily through Airport Utility. So let's click on Airport Bay, and now you see there's an edit button, and this is how I get to change details. Right now we've been looking at information except for the uh, firmware reversion. Uh, if I option click edit, I can get back to a previous mode of looking at this information, which is uh, like in the previous versions of Airport Utility, a floating window non-modal. But if I just click edit, I'm going to click the device again, click edit, it pops down like a sheet from the window, and it's you can't, you have to, it's a modal dialogue, you have to do something. So let's look at how this is organized. A lot of information is no longer available, and that's fine because it's not information we've needed, <laughs> you need for most network configurations. Uh, some of you may miss this, and then you'll need to use the older software. But I think for those who are more casual network users or trying to set up something simply, you'll like this. So to start with base station name, this is the name that shows up in the sidebar in Finder. It's the name that shows up in this display in Airport Utility. Password. Uh, set, up, set up over WAN, as we discussed earlier, allows remote access. And then here's back to my Mac. It does not mention app, uh, iCloud here, but Apple has told me that you could only use iCloud registered, iCloud connected Apple ID accounts. When you add an account, and you can add multiple so different people can access the same base station or files, uh, file servers attached uh, inside the time capsule or attached to the airport extreme or uh, time capsule through the USB port, you can add multiples. So I see a status is green, that means I'm connected and everything's fine with my account. The internet tab, now also somewhat simplified. You see it's got just a few things here. Uh, there's no IPv6 settings that's been removed. Uh, maybe that will come back because that's going to be important in the future. IPv6 is the next generation of numbering system for the internet and uh, many ISPs already use it internally or are starting to roll it out. It solves some problems and it makes it easier to have directly reachable devices if you need that. Um, as with previous releases, you can choose DHCP static or PPoE, PPP over Ethernet to connect to your broadband modem. Now, wireless, they've hidden some things away. You still have the same options here. Um, this space station, I've create and extend. It used to be you could hold down option and you get more options, but see they're not there now. The wireless distribution system, or WDS mode, that was available as an option to set up a static network where you entered the MAC addresses of each space station you wanted linked together, that was available and still can be used in airport utility up to version 5.6, so you could mix 802.11g and 802.11n devices, but I'm not a big fan of that. I've found that in hearing from many, many dozens of readers in my own experiments, mixing G and N airport devices over WDS does not work well. I recommend using Ethernet for that, and Apple has finally shed that legacy mode from this version. You name the wireless network, you have the same security options you've had, hold down the option key, you can get transitional network or WEP for using a mixed network, and the wireless password, and guest network is an option as always, with or without encryption. If you click the wireless options button, here's this is actually very similar to the wireless options uh, section of the previous version of Airport Utility. 
And now here's something that's useful is uh, you know that you can set these network, these uh, channels manually, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz channels. This is a dual band simultaneous uh, base station, which means I can use both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz at the same time. I've set channel 149 manually because these upper bands, 149, 153, 157, and 161, put out substantially more power and thus have more range than these lower number bands. It's a little known fact. The lower number bands put out about 5% of the power of these higher numbered bands. So in my network I want to have those higher number bands. For 2.4 gigahertz I let it be selected automatically. You also have the option here to uh, control compatibility of your network so you could lock it backwards. I explain this in great detail in my book what all this means because it's very complicated. If you hold down the option key you get even more options for turning on and off different wireless settings. So that's the wireless tab. Now network now, they packed pretty much everything remaining into network. This is where you'll find a lot of different things in one place. You choose the router mode. These labels have changed. This used to be called sharing, share an IP, distribute a set of addresses, and bridge mode, or bridging, uh, with the, or off bridge mode as we should say. And now it's much more explicit. This is more technical, but it's more accurate. DHCP and NAT is where this base station, the one that's connected to the broadband modem, is both uh, creating a pool of private addresses and using DHCP to assign them automatically to devices on the network when they request address. DHCP only passes through a range of addresses, but those are publicly reachable fixed addresses, either on a local network or internet addresses, and some people set up these configurations when they need reachable machines. Off, or bridge mode, is the same label, and that is used when you're passing through traffic from another base station for DHCP and NAT assignment. And that's what the other two base stations down here, my downstairs airport and guest room airport express, are both set to bridging because they're passing through that information from the main base station. These settings will be familiar if you used this before, setting an IP address, DHCP lease. This is explained again extensively in my book, um, how and where to set these up and create DHCP reserved addresses so the machine always has the same number on your local network. And it, uh, not port mapping, a default host and port mapping all now in this place still works the same. You can create uh, ways to punch through specific services from a local network inside your network to the greater internet. Timed access control is now the only remaining option for limiting access to your base station where a password isn't uh, an issue. Uh, enable access control uh, uh, used to have a radius option which allowed a remote server to control login so you could have one server that had all the login information and the base station passed through to that. That's no longer available. It's seen as sort of an enterprise or a corporate feature. Finally, we go to disks. And disks, I'll bring up a different device that has a disk attached. I'm going to say don't update because I'm not messing around with that. We'll go to downstairs airport. And you click here on network, you can see I'm set to off bridge mode on this device because it's passing everything through and everything is disabled except access control because access control you can set individually for each base station. Now if I click disks, uh, we see that we see that here's the so if I click the disks we see that I've got this uh, device attached and I've got the same options I used to there's no longer any windows sharing options that's pretty much it we've now run through most of the options in the in the software um, there are many things that are missing I've written about it at Tidbits. If you go to tidbits.com and search on airport utility, you'll find the article about that. In the base station menu, you'll see I've got to connect to the base station. Click edit because you have to have a password for access and then you can do show passwords and I will not show you my passwords. But that's the only option here. You can also import and export configuration files for, uh, for your base station so that you can create one and then copy it or make a backup. And that's pretty much it. Um, I find this new version of the software both better and worse. Um, the worst part is there are some settings like logging and, and network administrator features that I would like to have available and know people use all the time. But those features, you know, that's one of the trade-offs. You have something that's simpler, easier to use, and this graphical approach makes it much more straightforward to figure out how your network's laid out and what's wrong. Because we still have the 5.x versions of the software available, if you need those features, you can use the 5.x versions. If you need iCloud, if you want simplicity, you're teaching somebody who is a network neophyte to set up a network and they don't need all the extras, they're not running in a uh, corporate network, then this is a great option for them to start. You can find my book at takecontrolbooks.com 
uh, and the book's called Take Control of Your 802.11n Airport Network. At the moment, it's not updated for this version. We're working on an update, but the book covers the 5.x versions. So if you simply use that older version, you can use the book just fine. There's also an iOS version of Airport Utility that I'll cover in an upcoming edition that looks very much like this. This Mac update is taken directly from many of the new features and approaches found in the iOS version. Uh, if you'd like to read more on Tidbits, go to tidbits.com and read our various articles about airports, networking, and other Mac and iOS and Apple things. Thanks for listening. This is Glenn Fleischman. I'm an editor at Tidbits and the author of Take Control of Your 802.11n Airport Network.